thank you so much for being here. I want to welcome those who are watching online, especially our friends and our, our we are one church in two locations, Life Spring Church. Let's let them hear you. Make them welcome right now. Thank you so much. Hey, Amen. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Man, I tell you what, I am so excited. Did you, did you guys hear we had an anniversary Sunday last weekend? Did y'all hear anything about that? If you didn't, you must have been living under a rock, okay? I'm telling you. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I've been in ministry now, full-time ministry for over 20 years, and that's one of the greatest days in, in, in my ministry life. It was so emotional. There was at one point I had to come back and just as soon as it was over and I disappeared for a few minutes. I had to go and just sit in my office and I had an emotional meltdown. And I don't have many of those, okay? And uh, it was just an incredible day. Uh, you know, it was, it, you, you could see our church for the first time uh, that we've probably ever seen our church all together, all of us together under one roof, the sky. And uh, it was incredible. That was close to, we, we don't know exactly you know, the way if you were here, you know, it'd be almost impossible to get a real accurate count, but close to 600 people that were here. And uh, that just blew us away. We had to go to Subway and get more subs. And that was cool. And uh, yeah, you can get, yeah, you go ahead. Come on. You can clap all you want to clap all you want to awesome stuff. And then, and then what happened with the 1K, for those who weren't part of it, and uh, we went into the day with like, with 870, I think it was, that was, that was, uh, that we knew that we had reached for Jesus Christ. And people started coming up to get their number that had made a commitment, but they had never let us know. And some of them had been here for four years, five years, six years. Uh, well, not so much five and six, because that was beyond it. But anyway, for the last four years, they'd been here years, and they had, and we just, they never signed up. They thought they were on there. They thought they had made the, let us know know and we didn't know and so that number went from like 870 to right now 970 people that we have counted in the 1k commission and I'm yeah I, we said if we made the thousand it would be a miracle now I, I'm not 100% sure we didn't make the thousand so here's what we're going to do because a lot of people left and a lot of people whatever this weekend we're, we just want you to verify if you're not sure you're on the list and you don't know what your number is uh Miss Tanya our uh our administrative uh, team leader will be out here. Some her or some of her team will be right out here, and they got a little sign up that says "1K," and they've got the list there. And you can go in just an alphabetical order and find your name. And if you're not on the list, then we would like to add you and give you a number. So on your way out, if you don't mind, just just ducking right there to the right, or if you're watching online, send me an email, and we'll verify it and reply back to you. You can send it to Pastor Dale at SanleyChapel.com, and um, and and we would just like to know, just so we can see where we were. See if we, how close did we really get to the thousand? And and nine seventy is pretty close. Amen. Anybody, anybody win? So so we just want to see exactly where we were if we can, and uh and, and kind of get that uh and kind of get that kind of nailed down. And um and we're you know we talked about it last week. We're not going to stop, so it's a little bit irrelevant because we are going to keep going. We our vision is way bigger than a thousand people that we want to lead to Christ. But still, we would like to know because we're nosy. Anybody look at side up person say say you nosy? Go ahead and do that. Right? Yeah. We just want to know because we're nosy and that's the way that's the way we roll so we're uh, we're real 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 excited about that we're also excited about this new series and so I'm, I want to welcome you and maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior but you saw all the commotion last week on Facebook and you just decided you had to come check it out any church that's baptizing people in a horse trough deserves your attendance okay and so uh, so 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 yeah we heard them through like cows baby you know what I'm saying just get on in there head them up and move them out you know, and get them out of there. And uh, so you decided to come check it out. Now, I'm glad you're here, and I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy yourself. You don't have to believe like us to worship here. You don't have to believe like us to come to church. You don't even have to be a Christian to come and be a part of this if you want to investigate the claims of Christ. I do encourage you, though, to be honest, because God will reveal himself to you whenever you're honestly and sincerely seeking him. And, and when he does, I, I, I encourage you to step across that line of faith, because I believe if you seek, you'll find. And if you knock, the door will be open. And and, um, and, and he will show you who he is. So just, just, just have the courage and be ready. And this is a great week for you to be here because you're going to learn uh, some things about how the Christian life is supposed to work. And, and in fact, uh, you may have intuited.
intuitively already known some of these things. We're in a series called God First. Say that with me. The God First Life. Now say God First. Ready? God First. That's what I want you to get. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about God First. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency sometimes to get things out of order. Can anybody say amen, right? You, you ever done anything that's been backwards, you know? And, and where I'm from, there's an adjective we do before the backwards. We are backwards, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, we can't say that here. But that's the way, that's the way I've done a lot of things. For instance, anybody had a boat in here? Raise your hand. Anybody ever had a boat? Hold your hand. Anybody ever put your boat or jet ski in without putting the plug in? Can I see a witness? Yeah. <laughs> few of you. You see, it's the order matters whenever you don't have it. What you're supposed to do is put the plug in, then put the boat in the water, right? But when you get that backwards, it's a problem. Can anybody, you know what I'm talking about, right? You, you see, there's an order that things are supposed to go. People say, you get in the cart before the horse. You know what? I'm a horse person. I'm going to tell you something I've learned. It is better when the horse is front of the cart. You understand, right? Because there's some things in life that, 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 that order matters. And some things that don't matter, you can do things in random order. But there's a lot of things that matter. For instance, I just kind of made a list. I, I, I had a lot of fun with this. I made a long list, and I'm not going to give you the whole, whole list. But, but here's some things where... Where, where, where the way you do things matters. For instance, you should put your socks on before you put your shoes on. Right? Because it's very difficult to do it the other way around, right? I mean, it's very difficult to put your shoes on and then, and then put your socks on. Here's another one. It is very wise to deposit money before you spend the money. You, just, you, you may want to write that down, right? It's called balancing checks. I mean, order matters. Here's another one. It is very important that you fill the tank with gas before you drive the car. Right? Come on. Anybody ever ran out of gas? Hold your hand up. Good night. Yeah, that's what I thought, right? It's, it's very important that you study before a test, right? You know, right? It, it's, it's, it don't make much sense to study after the test, right? Hey, single teenagers, listen to me. Listen, it's very important you brush your teeth before you ask her out. <laughs> Just write that down right now. That's, that's news you can use. It's very important that you make it to the bathroom before you use the bathroom. You understand? I mean, there's so, there, there, there's, and I could keep going. I mean, I've got a lot of, and see, there's someone that's not as funny. I think, personally, it's important that you get married and, 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 and have a devoted home to Christ before you start having kids. Come on, somebody, say amen, right? It just kind of works better. Will it work the other way? Maybe, you know, yeah, but it's not the best way, right? It's very important that you wait to after marriage before you become sexually active, and, and most people who, who don't even believe in God often believe in that. I mean, it's just, we would, you would teach your kids that same thing because we know that intuitively. There's a lot of things in life where order matters. Anybody say amen, right? And, and, and so the, the order that you do things in, well, that's exactly what this series is about. This series is about order. And, uh, and we're basing this series on this book uh, by Stovall Weems called The God First Life. And, um, and actually, we're doing this with bunches of other churches that are going through this at the same time, and, and we're doing it in unison. Now, if you don't, I, I strongly encourage you to get this book and read this book. You can download it on your Kindle or in your iBooks, or, or you can buy it at Amazon, or you can, uh, or whatever. But, but you can also get it in our bookstore. We got a little bookstore now uh, right outside here. If you go out this door to the left, you got that door to the right, and it's a little bookstore there. And, uh, and we're, you know, I, I think like 15 bucks in our bookstore. And, and you can purchase them there. We got a limited number. You can get one uh, right now, right after this service, and then you can you can start, or either you can get your own. Whichever one's better for you. But uh, but 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 get the book, and I encourage you to read the book. Now let me just kind of sum this up and sum the whole series up and talk about where we're going. Here's the idea of the series: the Stanley Chapel and Life Spring Social Media Moment. So get you get your pencil ready. You can follow along. It be on the screen. It's also going to be. Um, uh, you know, you can fill out the, in the bulletin. There's a little outline you can fill in the blank, and then I want you to post or tweet whenever it gets boring in here. Ready? Here we go. An ordered life is a blessed life. Can, can, can anybody say that with me? Ready? One, two, three. An ordered life is a blessed life. Everybody, ready? An ordered life is a best life. This is, a, now, now, this is the basic idea of the series. Now, here's the passage. Uh, Pastor Mike alluded to it a while ago. It was a passage of Jesus. He was talking about this. It's based on this. He was, he was, uh, he was talking about the Sermon on the Mount. 
Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, it's a very, very famous sermon that he preached. And, uh, and he's talking about lifestyle issues, like Matthew 5 to 7, somewhere in there. And he's just talking about lifestyle issues. He's talking about things that matter and things that are that, 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 that great nuggets. You ought to go home and just, just read the Sermon on the Mount, like Matthew 5, start there, and just read through. And in the middle of that, he tells this little passage right here. And, uh, and, and we're going we're gonna to read the whole passage, and then we're going to come back and zero in on one verse that this whole series goes around. But, you, but, but I want you to get the context of it. So... We're going to read the whole thing right here. Ready? Matthew 6, 25 through 34. He says, this is Jesus talking. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Now, let's just stop for a few minutes here, okay? Do not worry about your life. To which I want to respond, well, what do you want me to worry about? Right? I mean, because what else is there to worry about? I mean, that's what we worry about is our life. Come on, somebody, say amen, right? I mean, we worry. I mean, you worry about your kids. Why? Because that's part of your life. You worry about your job. Why? Because that's part of your life. You don't worry about your old job. Why? Because you ain't there no more. I mean, you know why? Because that's what you worry. Whenever I show you a picture and I say, look at all of us, we all stand there and we all get in our picture took. And, and I say, look at our picture. Everybody, everybody gets the picture. Look at it. And you know what? You're gonna, what are you going to do? You're going to look at who? You. And if you looking good, you know what I'm saying? You ain't got it all hanging out and everything. You know, you looking good, right? You're going to say, that's a good picture. Now, the person beside of you, the person beside of you got spinach hung out their teeth, but you don't care. That's a good picture right there. That, we ought to use that one, right? You know? If I tell you that, that, that my clothes ain't fitting because I put on some weight, you ain't caring. You're worried about your clothes not fitting, Right? If I tell you that some kid got loose in kids' ministry and picked up rocks and I had to throw them at the parking lot, your first thing, hope it won't my car. Is it my car? No, he won't your car. You good. Let's go up and preach it, brother. Go ahead and preach it. Now. You ain't worried about it, right? Right? But if it's your car, you do, because that's what we worry about is my life. And he says, hey, don't worry about your life. And then he says, what, and he, he breaks it down for those of us who don't get it. What you will eat or drink. Now, I'm telling you, that's my life right there. It don't get no different than that, right? It's what I'm going to eat and what I'm going to drink. Or about your body. You know, come on, somebody, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Always concerned about what I look like and everything. What, what you will wear. <laughs> Some of you, that's, I mean, that just sums it up right there. What we're going to eat, because you already worried about that after this service, what you're going to eat. You're worried about, you know, what you look, your body. And I, I think I got a melanoma. Look at that. That's a, it could be a mole and a bruise, but I think that's a melanoma right there. You're worrying about your body, right? You're worrying about what you're going to wear tomorrow and all that kind of stuff. It's not life more than food, which I had to stop and really think that through i don't really know but i think so it's not life more than food and your body more than clothes mm. it's like he knew exactly where everybody lives right look at the birds of the air they don't work they don't sow or reap or store away in barns and yet their heavenly father feeds them are you not are, are you not much more valuable than they well not according to peter but i mean you know you might want to edit that out of the video whenever this. It's amazing what you say under the anointing. Are, are, are you not worth more than the birds? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spend. They ain't even got a job, in other words. Yet, I tell you that not even Solomon, now Solomon was a really, really rich dude in the, in the Old Testament. He had lots, he had mad coin, I mean, just, he had all this splendor and all this stuff. And not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? And then he says, you of little faith, which is kind of not cool because he also said it's impossible to please God without faith. So it's really not cool that he says we have little faith. That means we're not very pleasing to God whenever we're worrying about all those things. Verse 31, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans, and that's not a, not a word probably you use very often, but pagans are people who don't even believe in God. 
In other words, he's saying for pagans, people who don't even believe in God, people who don't believe they have a heavenly father, people who do not believe that God is outside of time taking care of you, people who do not feel like they're going to one day stand before God and, and give an account of their life. For those people who's not even, not even living for God, not even conscious of God, not even, not even factoring him into their decisions, not even factoring him into their equations, for pagans run after all these things, food and clothes and what you look like and all that stuff, and your heavenly fathers know, and your heavenly father knows that you need them. In other words, guys, listen, he says this over and over in the Bible. He says, listen, you, you're, you're a dad and you take care of your kids. How much more would your heavenly father take care of you? And see, people who don't even act like they've got a heavenly father, people who act like spiritual orphans, who, who don't even feel like, who feel like if it is to be, it's up to me, and who feel like they've got to make their own way, and it's all about them, and they, it's all, their destiny's in their hands, and, and, and those people worry about these things, but you, 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 you claim to have a heavenly father. You claim that there's a God who cares about you. You claim that there's a God who's outside of time taking care of you then there ought to be a difference at some point. For pagans, they're the ones worried about it. But your heavenly father knows you need them. And if you're good to your kids, how much more is he going to be good to his kids? And then verse 33. Read it out loud with me. One, two, three. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, therefore do not, and he says, therefore do not worry, he's kind of summing it up, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And everybody said, what? Amen. You don't even have to be a Christian to believe in that last line, right? <laughs> let, me, let me tell you what Jesus knows. Jesus knows that our unmet needs tend to dominate our thinking. Jesus knows that, that, that the way we equate, the way we think, is that happiness in life is related to having all these needs met. In fact, here's what most people think, is that, is that if I have the right career, plus the right spouse, plus plenty of money, minus pain and suffering, then I've got a good life. Most people think if I have a, if I'm really popular, if I'm really good, if I make a lot of money, you, you've got these things. And if you get these needs, if you get these needs for security, Matt, if I just had a husband who would secure, if I just had a money in the bank, if I just, if we could just make our bills, if I could just, it, it, it's like if you could get these things lined up, if you could get these needs met, and then you can minus from your life pain and suffering, then that's the happy life. And Jesus says right here, he says, listen, happiness is not about need. Happiness is about order. Now, I know there's a lot of talk right now from Christian world about where happiness plays into Christianity. I'm going to tell you the way I feel about that. I do not think Christianity, the goal of Christianity is happiness. But I do believe this. I believe that whenever you're living a Christ-centered life, that's the road to happiness. And I think God wants you to have a joy that is undescribable, indescribable and unspeakable. And I think he wants you to have it. In fact, the whole thing about happiness, God created that emotion. That was his idea. Now, it's not number one in our life, and it's not supposed to be number one in life, and it's not his primary objective for your life. We're going to look at what his primary objective is, but it's okay for you to want to be happy. But God says, listen, the road to happiness is not getting the right spouse, the right money, the right job, the right popularity, all the security, minus pain and suffering is the good life. That's not the road to happiness. He says the road to happiness is not about getting your needs met. It's about order. God has designed blessings to follow people whose lives, uh, God has designed blessings to be the consequence of a life lived in order. In fact, here's what you'll find in the Bible. Where order is restored, blessings follow. Where order is restored, blessings follow. Blessings are released in your life. Whenever, whenever a family gets in order, whenever a life gets in order, whenever a, a, a nation gets in order, whenever a church gets in order, blessings are released. Whenever they get in order. When, when we live with the God first life, then it, and you can track all the way, anybody who knows anything about the Bible, all of creation is predicated on that one fact that order releases the blessing in your life. And when things get out of order, the blessing is removed. 
I, I give you, for instance, it starts, you go all the way through the Bible, all the way through Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, when things were in order, everything was great. But when order was disrupted, the blessing was lost. Y'all ever heard the story of Adam and Eve, right? They had fellowship with God, the perfect kingdom. But when they got God out of order in their life, the blessing was the Old Testament, all the covenants, the Ten Commandments. You know what they were all about? They were about reestablishing order. All the time when God tried to create a covenant with his people is to reestablish the order. In fact, the very first commandment is thou shalt have no other what? No, No other what? God's before me. Why? Because he says, I want you to have the God first life. And you can go all the way through the Bible to Revelations. You know what Revelations is about? When Jesus comes back and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know what it's about? It's about order. The whole millennium is about order. It's about getting things back in line. You see, when the order is established, the blessing is released. But when the order is not right, the blessing cannot follow. How you order is a daily choice on your part and my part. We make a decision on how we're going to order our lives. It's a choice that we make. And a lot of times we come to church and we, we get excited and we think it's about emotion and we think it's all about, about that. And, it, and, and you know what? I'm glad about emotion. I love emotion. And sometimes people try to subtract emotion from church. I think that's a mistake. Uh, it's a mistake. It's like somebody trying to subtract emotion out of my marriage. I don't want that. You know what I'm saying? I like it when Melissa comes in the room and she looks at me and I get that, woo. You know what I'm saying? I like that. I don't want to subtract that. You know what I'm saying? I like that, but I ain't going to base my marriage on that. And even when I ain't got the goosebumps, I'm not walking away from her because all of a sudden fell out of love because you know what? It's deeper than the emotion. Same thing's true with Christianity. We don't want to subtract Christianity or emotion out of Christianity. We just don't want to base it on emotion. It's based on order. It's based on getting the right order, and it's a choice because you make a decision For what is going to be number one? You make a decision for how you're going to structure and how you're going to order your life. For instance, if you decide that football is extremely important, let me tell you what you're going to do. You're going to rearrange your schedule. You ain't going to go nowhere on Saturday and Sunday. And you're going to make sure you have ordered your life around football. And I ain't against football. I love football. I'm just telling you that right now. Uh, If you've decided keeping your job is important to you, then you're going to order your life around keeping your job. You're going to make sure you're there on time. You're going to make sure you get to bed early. You're going to make sure you're going to make sure you got wheels to get there and get, you're going to do what you got to do to keep that job. Because why? You have decided that that job is important to you. If you make a decision that Facebook is important to you, you will buy a smartphone and make sure you create opportunities to check those notifications, right? Come on, right? You may decide that a TV show is important to you. You will make a decision to DVR it or be at home, right? Because you know why? That's important to you. You have made a decision. If you make a decision that a, a person, your spouse, is important to you or your kids are important to you, then you make a decision on how you're going to order your life, that your family is important to you. If you make a decision, you see, we decide how we're going to order our lives. And Jesus says, when order is established, the right order is established, that's when blessings are released. That's when happiness comes. It's not based on needs getting met. It's based on order. Everybody with me? If so, say amen. Amen. The ordered life is the blessed life. Now, what I want us to do is I want us to learn in this series how to order our lives so that we can re- that, so that God can release the blessing and the blessing can be restored in our lives. So I want to come back and look at this verse. In fact, I, I would like for us to read it again, verse 33, and I want you to memorize this verse. This, this will be a memory verse for this series. Ready? Matthew 6, 33. I want everybody to read it out loud. I can hear all those I'm in the spirit world at Life Springs and online, even if you're watching it in, at, on the computer in your underwear. Read this verse out loud, okay? Matthew 6, 33. 
But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, we're going to come back and unpack that verse. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to unpack this verse, and what we're going to find in this verse is it's going to unlock the blessings in our life. When you can get that one verse, it can be the key. Even if you, and I hope you don't miss a single message of this series, but, but, but if you will unlock that verse, it can be the key to releasing blessing in your life. Is everybody with me? If so, say amen. I, I want you to get this. I want you to listen to it with your ears. I want you to listen to it with your mind. And I want you to listen to it with your heart. Because the word of the Lord, the Holy Spirit's going to speak something to somebody in here. And I, and, I don't, I, and I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. I want you to hear the word of the Lord whenever he speaks to you. So here we go. Number one, ready? Keys to restoring life's blessings. Number one, redirect your energy. Redirect your energy. Matthew 6, says, but seek what? But seek first his kingdom in other words jesus says the first thing you need to do is seek my kingdom not your kingdom my kingdom because you'll never be happy as long as you're the god of your world did you hear me you will never be happy you will never be blessed as long as you are the god of your world if it's all about building your kingdom you're never going to be happy until you realize it's not about you in fact, one of the most fundamental decisions you're going to ever make in your life, listen, one of the most fundamental decisions you're going to ever make in your life is whose kingdom is most important, yours or God's. And don't tell me, well, of course God's kingdom. No, no, no. We're going to track it by your effort and your energy and what you're doing. The, one of the most important decisions you're ever going to make is whose kingdom you're going to build. Yours are Who's going to be the God of your world? Who's going to be the king of your kingdom? You or Jesus? That's, that's a fundamental decision you're going to make at some point. And, and, and one day, he'll come and he'll establish his kingdom. And he's the ultimate king. You're going to ultimately lose. Let me just go ahead and tell you that, in case you didn't know that. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, and he'll bow to nobody. Anybody say amen, right? He'll ultimately, he'll ultimately intrude. He'll ultimately, but right now, the most fundamental decision you'll ever make is who's your king? Whose kingdom are you building? He says, seek ye first his king. Now, now notice what he says. He said, seek what? Seek what? First. He did, he, he did not say that's, that, that you can't seek other things. He didn't say you couldn't seek other things. He said, seek what? Seek first. See, sometimes people get a misconception about being a Christian. And they think, well, I can't seek those things in the world because you know what? Now I've decided I'm going to be a Christian. No, it, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say, G Jesus, that's not what he said. He knows that you need security. That's okay. He knows you need clothing. And I'm grateful that you got something to cover up with, right? Come on, somebody. Look at her side of the side and say, you look good with clothes. Go ahead and do that right now. You go ahead and do it. Yeah, you, you, you need that. Everybody know God knows you need food. Come on, somebody. Thank God for that, right? Maybe not as much as we take in, but he knows we need food, right? He knows you need shelter. God knows you need football. I mean, basic needs in life. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. God, God knows you need those things, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. What you, he didn't say you couldn't seek those things, but he says, seek what? Seek first. It's about order. It's about make sure you put the plug in the boat before you put it in the water. Put the socks on before you put the shoes on. Put the money in the bank before you pay the bill. It's about order of you. Seek first. It's the priority. And some people say, well, I just ain't got time to be a Christian. I can't add this on to my life because I'm so busy and I can't really got time to really give my life to God because I ain't got time. You know why you don't have time? Because see, here's what you're doing. You're already spending time pursuing those very things that Jesus said that you are tempted to make your God. Food and dress and your body. You're already pursuing those things. And what he's saying right here is I want you to redirect your energies. I want you to switch your focus. I don't want you to make it all about that because let's, come on, come on, let's just, let's just get honest. We're already spending so much energy on things that are not giving anything back to us. Can anybody say amen? 
You're already investing so much emotional energy in things that you're getting nothing out of. In fact, what it's turned into is not only you're not getting nothing out of it, it's actually taking something away from you because now you're worried to death, right? You stay in a panic all the time. Your pace is in a panic. Your nerves are in a panic. Your anxiety is in a panic. And you can't even sleep at night. You're taking something. You're, you're, you're drinking Red Bull in the morning to get going and about 14 cups of coffee and energy drinks for lunch. And then you take sleeping pills at night or something to help you go to sleep. Because you're just constantly in a worry. And you know what? Let me tell you about worry. Worry will zap your energy. Can anybody say amen? Worry, worry, will, worry will zap your energy for today, and it will destroy your hope and your joy for tomorrow. Worry's like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it don't get you nowhere. Right? Is energy. You know the Bible talks about meditation. Worry is the opposite of med is meditation, but it's meditating on negative things. You see, meditation in Scripture is when you think about a truth about God or a verse, and you blow it up and get it bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what worry is in a negative way. You, you, you think about what, what if and maybe, and, and you keep getting it bigger and bigger and bigger, and it doesn't take any. What it does is it takes away. It doesn't add anything to you. And Jesus says, listen, I want you to put God first. And when you put God first, first, you're going to get something in return. You're going to get the highest level of return from your investment. Why? Because when you put God first, it is backed by the power of the most high God. I'm telling you, this not talking about an act of worship. He's talking about a lifestyle of worship. And let me tell you about worship, and i got to move on. But let me tell you about worship. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Isn't that great news? Somebody say amen, right? What that means is that he dwells, he hangs out, he's there, he lives in the praises of his people. So when you have a lifestyle of worship, how many of you like to know God's with you? Hold your hand up good and high. Then you know how you get that is you have a lifestyle. I'm not talking about singing songs, your eyes closed. I'm talking about it's a lifestyle where God is first and he inhabits the praises of his people. He's with you. And let me tell you what the Bible says. Whenever God's with you, it says where the spirit of the Lord is. Did anybody know what it says? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Now, wouldn't you like to have some freedom in your life? Wouldn't you like to be free from all this worry and anxiety and panic and all this stuff's going on? The Bible says that the Spirit of, well, the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And you know what he puts there? The Bible says that the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 6, is love, joy, peace, gentleness, patience, kindness. You know what? I'm telling you, you want some of that in your life. Can anybody say Amen. Wouldn't you like to have a little less worry and a little more love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness? Wouldn't you like to have that? The key is putting God first. The key is a lifestyle of worship. Because you know what you need? Everybody's walking around and they're, they're fatigued and they're, they're downcast and they have no energy and they don't need another Red Bull and a monster drink necessarily. What they need, they need is God in their life. They need the Spirit of the Lord because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now, I'm preaching better than y'all acting like I am right now. I'm telling you. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And what they need is they need God's joy in their life so that they have a strength to make it. And it happens whenever you get the right order. Blessing is released when order is restored. Everybody understanding what I'm saying? If so, say amen. He says, seek first the kingdom. That, and, then, and, and then that's the first practical step is you got to read. You're already seeking things. You're already seeking clothing. You're already seeking money. You're already seeking jobs. You're already seeking food. You're already seeking success. You're already seeking security. You need to redirect your energy and seek what? Seek first his kingdom. Not your kingdom. His kingdom. Second decision. Second thing you need to do is choose God's standard. You need to choose God's standard. He said, but seek First, his righteousness. Now, that's probably not a word you use very much. Now, let me just pause. Seek means to thoroughly search to a binding agreement, that you come to a binding resolution, that you have, you have settled it in your heart, to seek first his righteousness. Now, righteousness means God's right way of doing things. It, 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 means, it, it means that what is redeemed, what is deemed right by the Lord by, after his examination, that's what's right. 
He says, seek first, search for God's right way. In other words, seek first his righteousness. That means that means that you thoroughly search God's right answers, what's doing right, and then you make a decision that I'm going to live not by external pressures, but I'm going to live by internal convictions. I'm going to search my heart. I'm going to search God's word. I'm going to find out what God says is right, and I'm making a binding agreement that that's how I'm going to live my life. That is going to become my way of doing that. My life is going to be done God's Way and he says it says search. It means a binding agreement. You know what a binding agreement is? A binding agreement is when you make the decision, you make the one-time decision that God is going to guide your life, and then you spend the rest of your life managing that decision. You you know what's wrong with a lot of people? A lot of people is the the problem is they make they don't make the one-time decision. You know why? You ever, come on, don't look at them. But y'all know people who are back and forth with God in their relationship with God, back and forth, back and forth, up and down, up and down. Y'all know anybody like that? I mean, don't look at them, but you know people like that, right? You know, you know why? Because they decide, then they redecide, and then they redecide, and then they redecide, and then they redecide, and they redecide, and they keep redeciding. You need to quit redeciding. It's this binding agreement where you seek first. You have reached a place where you have settled it in your heart. This is my decision, and I'm not going to redecide. I'm going to make that decision, and then the rest of my life, I'm going to manage that decision. And so, so people who don't do that, they're constantly deciding. They're saying they're waking up every week. Should I go to church? Should I not go to church? Should I go to church? Should I not go to church? Every week, should I give money? Should I tithe? Should I not tithe? Should I serve? Should I not serve? Should I join a group? Should I not join a group? Should I, should I be, should I, uh, should I, how should I act in front of this group of people? How should I not act in front of this group of people? How, should I tell the truth right here? Should I not tell the truth right here? Should I tell a white lie? Should I not tell a white? You see, they're redeciding, they're redeciding, they're redeciding. They're, 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 they're making decisions based on their circumstance, based on their culture, based on the situation. Listen, that is not seeking first his righteousness. That's just making up as you go. You make a one-time decision, one-time decision based on his judgment, not what feels right at the time. You search the word, and then you manage that decision for the rest of your life. And that means that you nail the back door shut. I I remember when I bought my first house, I remember I I went to this, uh, my my agent, he said a wise thing when it came to business, a wise thing. This is wise. If anybody's buying a house, we went to the house and and it had, it was way below market value and I had to put some uh, sweat equity in it to make money. He said, Dale, he said, this is the house you probably want because here's what he said. Here's what he said. He said, I never want to buy a house that don't have a back door in it. Now, he won't talk about a physical back door, but what he's saying, if you get in this house and something happens and you whatever, you want to be able to sell this house and get out of it what you got in it or more. Great business decision. A few years later, I was counseling with a lady who was deciding on whether or not to leave her husband. There were some serious trouble in it. I, I think the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that conversation. And she said, she said I, I, you know, I've always got a back door. And I said, you know what, that, that's, that's a problem. As long as you got a back door in this marriage, this marriage is never going to work. You need to go home and nail that back door shut. You, you don't need, this is a, to death do us part. That lady's still married 15, 20 years later. And she will tell you if she gave her testimony, it's because she nailed the back door shut. You know what some of you need to do? You need to nail that back door shut. I ain't going to go back there. I have made my decision because as long as you're yo-yoing back and forth, you're not going to do it. You're not going to. I mean, but so so what that means is that you decide you you don't redecide over and over and over that Jesus is Lord. You make this decision and say I'm going to manage this decision for the rest of my life. So so you for instance you say I'm going to have a lifestyle of worship and I'm going to be faithful to the house of God. Then guess what? Whenever you wake up and and whenever it's time to go to church or whether you come on Thursday or you go on Sunday morning, whatever, it is time for you to go. You say you know what? I, you're not making decisions. Well, what's the weather like? And I don't know if I feel like it. And I kind of got burst us in my hip, you know, and I got to, no, no, my decision was already made. And now I'm managing my decisions. I've already decided this is, I'm going to be, I'm the type of person who's going to be faithful. This is who I am. This is my identity. I'm going to be faithful to the house of the Lord. So when it comes to tithing and you get ready to tithe, you don't make the decision on the fly. Well, how much have I got and how much is my job and how am I stable? And here's what we're saving for. This is what we want to buy and this is what we got to have. No, 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 no. I made a decision that God is first. I'm going to seek him first and 
Blessing is released when order is restored. Come on, y'all ain't saying much here, but come on now. And, I, and, and I've made the decision. So right now, I'm, I'm just managing my decision. My decision was already made. I have decided this is the person I, I'm going to be. A one-time decision. I'm going to manage it. Rest of my, same thing for serving. Same thing for being a part of a group or whatever it is. You make your decision. Same thing about marriage. Same thing about kids. Same thing about that. I'm going to make my decision, and I'm going to manage that decision. Does that mean you're always perfect? No. Nope. In fact, if you're perfect, you're not allowed to come to church here because we're going to mess you up. Nobody's perfect, but what it means is me missing church is the exception, not the rule. It means that me messing up on that is an exception. Why? Because I've already decided. And now I'm managing my decision. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Hold your hand up if you, you understand what I'm saying because you see the bottom line, as long as you're playing those games and redeciding, you're never going to get there. When years ago, I remember hearing this story about two little boys walking home from school, and they always wanted to know what was on the other side of this wall. And they had a hat, and in those days, you had to have the hat and the coat, and the families were poor. And one day, one little boy was walking by that wall. They always wanted to know what was on the other side, but they never would cross it. They didn't think they could. And one day, he took his hat off, and he threw his hat across the wall. And the other little boy said, what in the world have you done? You threw your hat, your mama's going to kill you. He said, I guess i got to go across that wall. Guess what? He made it across. Because you know what? When he threw that hat, he was making a commitment. Some of you need to throw your hat across the wall when it comes to the things of God. You need to quit riding that fence. You need to quit deciding and redeciding and deciding and redeciding. You need to nail that back door shut, throw your hat across the wall and say, this is who I am. I have made a binding agreement. I have searched it out. And this is what God says is right. And if that's what God says is right, I'm seeking first his righteousness. That's who I am. This is my identity. This is who I am in Christ. This is what my legacy is going to be. This is what my life is going to be about. The Bible says, don't worry. You know what, you know what worry, and I got to move on. Worry, you know, other translation says, be anxious for nothing. Everybody talks about anxiety, and the root word of anxiety is anxious. You know what that means right there? That, that, that word means to be dual, dual minded, to be double minded. In other words, there's one side of your mind that says do this, and the other side says do this, and it creates tension. That's why people say, I'm falling apart. I'm coming apart. I'm that's what it literally means. That's what that word literally means is that you're falling to pieces because you, you're pulling two different ways. It's time for you to quit pulling two different ways because it's going to stress you out. You're going to be eat up with nerves the rest of your life until you decide, I ain't double-minded. I'm seeking his right, his way, what he deems right. I'm making a decision. And now I'm going to spend the rest of my life managing the decision I made. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? It, 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 it's, it's something you got, you got to do that. And then all of a sudden, the, so much of our stress will become irrelevant when we decide to make him number one. And then the third thing, this is the part everybody's been waiting for. Ready? Enjoy the blessings. Enjoy the blessings. Matthew 6, says, all these things, all these things you've been worried about, your clothes, what you're going to eat, where you're going to go, all these things will be given to you as well. You know why? Because you've redirected your energy. You've chosen God's standard. And now you get to enjoy the blessings. Because God can add to you all those things that you know and thought you needed. And now, watch this. Now you have all those things. Watch this. And all those things don't have you. Because you got somebody first. Now you have all those things that all those things don't have you. And now God can give you all those things and, and, and instead of you being consumed. That's what he starts out in that passage. He's saying, don't be consumed by these things. And now he can bless you with them. And he don't have to worry about you being consumed by them. Because now you got peace and security and food and blessings. You know why? Because your faith is not in the job. That's why you got panic. That's why you worry. Your faith is not in your ability. That's why you've been worried. Your faith is in your heavenly Father. That's what separates you from pagans. Is you got a heavenly. You're not a spiritual orphan. You got a heavenly Father. These are divine byproducts from God. So here it is. Ready? Where order is restored blessing is released. Say that with me. Where order is restored, blessing is released. Ready? Where order is restored, blessing is released. That's what God wants for you as an individual. That's what he wants for your family is order to be restored. That's what he wants for this church and the church as a whole. That's what he wants for the United States of America is for order to be restored. 
so blessings can be released. The key to unlocking the blessing is not getting the need met. The key is putting God first. When God is first, when God is truly first, I am absolutely convinced it is His pleasure to bless His kids. I think I love blessing my kids. Y'all love blessing your kids. But I don't want to bless them with anything that's going to hurt them. But when order is restored, He feels free to bless. I think God wants to bless your life. I think God wants to do something great in your life. But you're going to have to quit worrying about your needs and start worrying about your Father. And make His kingdom first. His righteousness. How many of you understand this message? Hold your hand up. I, I want to give you an opportunity right now to throw your hat across the wall. Would you close your eyes? You see, I, I, I want to give you an opportunity right now to make this decision and then spend the rest of your life managing this decision. I, I want to give you that opportunity. Would you right now in your own way, maybe you don't even know Christ as Lord, maybe you do know Christ as Lord. I don't know. Wherever you are on that continuum, I don't know. But right now, some of you right now, you're worried. Maybe you're, you you called yourself a Christian and you, you, you've asked God to come into your heart and life. And I want you to know He has done that. His redeeming work. He is faithful to do what you've asked Him to do. But listen, you need to quit seeking your kingdom because now you're not a spiritual orphan anymore. Maybe you are a spiritual orphan. Maybe you've never asked God into your heart. And right now is your time. Would you just say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I don't want to be an orphan. I want a heavenly father. I want to know somebody's taking care of me. I want to know somebody has a promise to me. I want to know somebody is looking out for me. And I give my life right now to you. If you're praying that prayer, you're just as much a Christian as I am. God don't love me no more than he does you, no matter what you've done. No matter what you hadn't done, you're a Christian. And we want to celebrate that. Hey, I want to get a light on this cross. Check that box on your blue card. But we're going to celebrate that. Now, maybe some of you right now, you're a Christian, but you've not been seeking first his kingdom. How many of you would say that? You're a Christian. You, you would call yourself a Christian, but you've not been acting like somebody who has a heavenly father. You've not been placing him first. And now you're just, your life is a mess and your, your emotions are a mess and you're just, you're, you're running hectic and scattered and you don't have peace and joy. The joy of the Lord is not your strength. You're empty. How many of you say, Dale, this is for me right here. Right here, this is for me. This sermon's for me. Hold your hand up good and high. Good and high. I want to pray for you. Yeah. Yeah, I see your hands. Anybody, just hold it up good and high. If you run it on empty and you, you feel like that you need to get your life back in order because you need the blessings of God in your life, would you hold your hand up good and high? Father, for every hand right now raised, I pray that right now they would throw their hat across the wall. Right now they would nail that back door shut. That right now they would just say, I'm going to seek first God's kingdom. I'm getting my life in order. I'm getting my household in order. I'm not going to live with this stress. I'm not going to live with this mess. I'm going to detangle this this thing and I'm going to get things back in order. Would you stand up right now? Would you stand up and would you give God a hand clap of praise for being a God who wants to bless his kids? Thank you God. Thank you God. Thank you God for not being a God who's always angry. Thank you for not being a God we got to appease but the God whose only thing he's ever wanted is to be number one. This altar's open. Would you worship the Lord and let's place him number one in our life.